Space missions such as this may soon become a practical reality because of engines powered by nuclear energy. Compared with conventional rockets, nuclear engines are more efficient and thus are more practical for travel over vast distances, particularly for manned missions beyond the moon. The feasibility of such engines has already been demonstrated in the rover program, sponsored jointly by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Atomic Energy Commission. In recent ground tests, Kiwi-type engines have been operated at full power, shut down, and restarted with complete success. The 50,000-pound thrust Kiwis proved the basic techniques that will be used in the 250,000-pound thrust Phoebus now under development and the even more powerful clustered reactors of the future. However, before the first nuclear rocket engine can be launched, several safety areas must be considered. For example, what might be the consequences of a nuclear accident on or near the launch pad, and what means can be employed to prevent such accidents? A nuclear incident might occur if chemical fuels in the first stage booster produced implosive forces great enough to compress the reactor into a critical mass. If the reactor impacted in the ocean, seawater flooding the core would cause the reactor to become highly supercritical. Since extremely high temperatures are required to vaporize uranium graphite fuel, little is known about the way a nuclear excursion would be terminated. A thorough understanding of reactor response to abnormal operating conditions is required to predict the magnitude of all potential accidents. A second major problem concerns safe methods for disposing of the highly radioactive reactor in or above the atmosphere after operation. One possibility would be to produce an extremely rapid nuclear transient within the reactor, which would cause the core to vaporize or disintegrate into small, harmless particles. To provide answers to these and other questions, the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory performed an experiment called the Kiwi Transient Nuclear Test, or Kiwi TNT. In this experiment, a modified Kiwi reactor was forced to go supercritical and destroy itself under controlled conditions in order to test theoretical predictions of the energy release and fission product dispersal and to determine the degree of core fragmentation. The TNT experiment was conducted at NRDS, the Nuclear Rocket Development Station, which is a part of the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada test site. NRDS occupies a remote desert area called Jackass Flats, located some 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada. The primary mission at NRDS is the testing of nuclear rocket engines developed under the rover program. Because of its existing facilities and its isolation from populated areas, NRDS was ideally suited as the site for the Kiwi TNT experiment. Three major facilities at the development station were utilized for TNT. The reactor was assembled at the Maintenance, Assembly, and Disassembly, or MAD building, and was then moved by rail to the test point. A special site for the TNT experiment was constructed on the tracks about three miles from the MAD building and about 600 feet from the test cell C complex where recent Kiwi reactors have been run. A cable barricade was erected between the TNT site and the test cell to prevent large fragments from flying into the test cell area. All control and instrumentation lines for the experiment were run underground and connected with existing facilities at the test cell which in turn is connected through underground lines to a central control point two miles away. The reactor used for the TNT was a specially modified Kiwi B. 
The nozzle assembly and certain internal support structures were deleted since there would be no gas flow through the core. In addition, the control rod operating mechanism and neutronic balance of the core were substantially modified to permit achieving the very rapid transient required. As with all Kiwi reactors, the control rods were hydraulically operated. However, the TNT used a more powerful pump, accumulator bottles, and larger pipes and valves. Sudden release of the hydraulic fluid stored in the bottles at the pressure of 1,300 pounds per square inch could rotate the rods up to 4,000 degrees per second. Each rod and solenoid actuated hydraulic valve was equipped with a key operated lock to prevent accidental rod rotation. In order to achieve a greater total reactivity change than is possible with standard Kiwi reactors, the neutronics balance of the TNT core was altered so that even with the control rods in the full off position, the reactor was very close to the delayed critical condition. To make the reactor safe to work around, neutron absorbers were added to lower criticality. Two boron aluminum plates fitted around two 60 degree portions of the core and could be slowly removed by remotely controlled motor driven screw jacks. Like the rods and hydraulic valves, the jacks were equipped with safety locks so that the plates could not be withdrawn accidentally. A mirror above the reactor allowed instrumentation cameras to look into the core. Several hundred photo flash bulbs mounted below the mirror provided illumination for instrumentation cameras an instant before the test. The TNT experiment was covered by extensive instrumentation for measuring and recording the effective energy release and the distribution of particulates and effluents resulting from the test. The information gathered provided the data needed to determine the actual conditions reached in this experiment and to provide a firm basis for estimating the effects of other accidental or deliberate reactor excursions. Pressure transducers measured the overpressures produced in the immediate vicinity of the reactor. Pin gauges inserted into the core measured the core expansion rate due to the sudden energy release. Radiation levels in the neighborhood of the reactor were measured by fission foils, film badges, and counters. One array of radiation measuring equipment was placed along the tracks at various positions ranging from 50 feet to 560 feet. Each station in the array held foils and sample materials for measuring gamma and neutron radiation doses. Other sampling stations were located in all directions from the reactor, but were placed with greatest frequency in the downwind area. This particular station held adhesive coated slides for collecting small particles and a film holder that measured x-rays emitted by particles. An array of hoppers was set up for collecting particles that would reveal the size and distribution of the fragments from the reactor. Polyethylene strips on the ground were used to collect additional fragments. This station held three sampling and monitoring devices, adhesive coated glass plates for particle collection, a small sample of lithium-7 for fission measurements, and a monitor that transmitted radiation levels to remote readout indicators in the control point area. Since information concerning radioactive effluent was desired for relatively great distances, sensitive radiation monitoring and sampling equipment was stationed throughout the downwind area as far as 50 miles from the TNT site. Each trailer was equipped with a generator and three air sampling units. Samples collected on the filter paper in the sampling heads revealed radioactive gases or debris resulting from the effluent cloud.
The trailers were controlled by radio link from the control point area. The TNT experiment was covered by a battery of instrumentation cameras. Some were located in underground bunkers less than 500 feet from the TNT site and operated at speeds up to 23,000 frames per second. These cameras looked directly into the core by means of a 45 degree mirror above the reactor. Other cameras covered disintegration of the pressure shell and recorded the size and shape of the effluent cloud. In addition to its primary purpose, the TNT experiment proved useful for a variety of other scientific experiments. Since the TNT excursion was expected to achieve a fission rate approximately 1,000 times greater than fission rates that can be reached in the laboratory, the test provided a unique opportunity for exposing samples to a massive prompt neutron burst. Most of the samples tested were various types of nuclear fuel elements. Some of the samples were embedded in foam material for protection from physical shock damage. Some of the fuel element samples were in small electrically heated ovens so that they could be tested at their normal operating temperatures. The sample materials were enclosed in metal canisters painted with fluorescent colors to aid in locating and recovering them. The experiments were conducted by groups from the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, as well as several other government agencies and industrial concerns. The samples were placed at various locations in the immediate vicinity of the reactor to achieve a wide range of neutron intensity. The actual time for conducting the TNT experiment was dictated by predetermined weather requirements. The test could be run only when the wind direction and intensity were satisfactory up to an altitude of 10,000 feet. The site for the TNT was selected so that effluent radiation levels outside the controlled area would be at safe levels. The test was therefore not run until the wind was from the northeast so that the effluent cloud would be carried over a sparsely populated desert area in the direction of Death Valley. On the morning of January 12, 1965, wind and weather conditions were ideal and the test operation began. The area was closed two hours before the test and all personnel were cleared through the checkpoints. A final security check was made by air to ensure that all unauthorized personnel were out of the area. Members of the control rods team were the last personnel allowed in the area. Their job was to release the safety locks on the rod actuators, hydraulic valves, and poisoning vein screw jacks. The reactor was now under the control of operators at the central control point. N1 heater on. NET is, uh, do you have the BF3 on? BF3s are, are on right now. All right. Are you baseline? When the control rods team had cleared the area and all equipment checks had been completed, the final countdown began. Give me the F minus 90 mark bus. Understood. 100 seconds remaining. <laughs> On the mark, it will be F minus 90 seconds. Mark, it is now F minus 90 seconds. Put on goggles or turn away. Repeat, it is now F minus 90 seconds. Put on goggles or turn away. CTO at F minus 60, push the run button. Right. 9, 8, 7, 6, 
five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Run button in. F minus 60 and counting. We have a go on pin cameras, go on J, go on data. F minus 54. We have a go on J12. Go on core cameras, F minus 48. Four five. Four zero. Three five. We're no go on field cameras, Milligan CEC. Three zero. F minus thirty. Minus twenty five, we have a go on field cameras. F minus twenty. Still no go on Milliken C C. Minus fifteen. Bucket power off. Minus ten. We have a go on Milliken C C. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire. Wow. Timer's on. Wow. Very nice. This sequence shows the TNT excursion at the speed at which it actually occurred. The following sequence shows the experiment slowed down some 16 times from the original 400 frames per second. The glowing particles were fragments of unloaded graphite from the core. The uranium-loaded fuel elements were almost totally vaporized or fragmented into a very fine particulate matter. This sequence was taken at 2,500 frames per second and shows the excursion slowed down some 100 times. Now the same sequence with individual frames held for several seconds to show the excursion in greater detail. As the experiment begins, the core illuminated by photo flash bulbs becomes visible in the mirror above the reactor. Note the blue glow of ionized air around the reactor.
As the reaction continues, white-hot gases expand from the top of the core, and a pear-shaped cloud forms as the pressure vessel disintegrates. This sequence, photographed at 23,000 frames per second, shows the top of the core as seen through the mirror. The individual frames are held briefly to show the reaction in better detail. The first reaction that appears is deep within the core and is seen through the fuel passages in the core. Note that the reaction began around the edges and then appeared as a star-shaped pattern at the center of the core. This pattern is due to variations in fuel loading and the poisoning effect of certain support element materials. The pattern becomes obscured as gases are generated within the core. The gases become visible as they begin to surge from the end of the core. The dark objects at the top, right, and bottom are fission detectors located about two feet above the core. As the gases continue to rise, the detectors are obscured. As the gases rise higher, moving at a speed of 3,000 feet per second, the mirror itself is obscured. B-57 sampling aircraft began tracking the cloud and collecting samples within a few minutes after the excursion. The aircraft were used to collect samples of airborne fission products and reactor materials from which the total energy release of the excursion could be determined. The cloud reached a height of 2,000 feet above the terrain within two minutes after the excursion. The radioactivity in the cloud was composed of about 90% particulate and 10% gaseous fractions. Radiation at distances of one half mile to 50 miles from the TNT site was relatively insignificant. Radiation exposures were well below established permissible levels and within the levels predicted in advance for the TNT experiment. Re-entry into the TNT area was closely controlled by radiation safety personnel. Approximately 10 minutes after the test, the first recovery teams were cleared through the checkpoint and allowed to move to a point 400 feet from the TNT site. As soon as radiation levels permitted, the teams moved in closer to recover samples and monitoring equipment. Radiation safety monitors, identified by their yellow suits, accompanied each recovery team. The recovery teams worked quickly in the important task of collecting samples. The total radiation exposure received by any of the team members was well below the established permissible levels. In spite of the rather spectacular appearance of the Kiwi TNT experiment, the mechanical and radiation effects were limited to a rather small area. General air shock and shrapnel damage was limited to a radius of 100 to 200 feet, although some fragments of the reactor were thrown to distances up to 10 times that great. Test cell C itself suffered no damage, but there were some broken windows and wall panel movement in light sheet metal structures nearby. Normal operations were resumed at test cell C six days after the TNT test was conducted. Massive biological radiation effects extended to about 600 feet with a mean lethal dosage distance of about 450 feet. Beyond 1,200 feet, exposed personnel would not have received more than normal tolerance doses from the direct radiation. In the downwind direction, 
there was of course the additional dosage due to the cloud passage and settling out of radioactive debris. Final results of the Kiwi TNT experiment will not be available until all data have been collected, processed, and analyzed. The preliminary analysis indicates that the energy release, rate of reaction, and external effects were all within the limits predicted. The excursion produced about 3 times 10 to the 20 fissions, or 10,000 megawatt seconds, quite close to predictions. The TNT test was undertaken only after extensive calculations had been made to predict the detailed history of the nuclear excursion. These calculations involved a number of assumptions and approximations which the test results now place on a much firmer basis. There is now a known point of departure for extending such calculations to a variety of situations. The primary application of these results will be to the nuclear safety aspects of the nuclear propulsion operations. In addition, the required conditions and consequences of a deliberate destruction of the propulsion reactor are now known, and this knowledge may have practical value in the disposal of flight systems after operation. The second important result of the Kiwi TNT test is the accumulation of detailed information on the history of the effluent cloud. A detailed comparison of meteorological predictions and actual gaseous and particulate distribution has been undertaken and should lead to a vastly improved understanding of the mechanics involved. This understanding is of considerable importance to the nuclear industry as a whole, as well as to the nuclear propulsion program.